with you. It is great to be back, and it's awesome to celebrate my 14th anniversary with my beautiful bride. This Tuesday, when Chris was started talking about himself, I was like, what, what? I thought I had planned this picture to go up. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> but I love Chris so much. Uh, of course, I know Marissa's celebrating her anniversary, too. Amen. On the same day. Now, we're 2005. My sister, what year are you? The same year. Wow. I knew it was the same day. I forgot it was the same day, year. Wow. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. It is the exact same day and year. That is pretty awesome right there. Family, we are continuing our Genesis series today and uh, very encouraged to have you here with us this morning. Uh, I, I really believe this series will inspire you, motivate you, draw you closer to the Lord. Amen. But before you go to Genesis, I want you to turn to the book of Jude. Now, of course, Jude is or was the half brother of Jesus. So we, we need to learn what he has to say here about uh, Cain as we're going to study out Genesis chapter four today. Now, remember last week, we looked in Genesis 2 and 3, and we looked at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? Amen. And of course, the title of the message was, Would You Be Satisfied with Paradise? Because even in paradise, Adam and Eve were not satisfied, and they were led astray by Satan to commit sin, amen? amen. And the question for us last week was really, would you, uh, will you allow dissatisfaction in your life to open up the door for Satan to get on in? to tempt you away from God. Are you with me here? I think it's of God that the whole theme here, even from Chris talking about happiness to also talking, even the last um, song we sang, Trust and Obey, the only way to be happy in Jesus is if we trust and obey. The reason why people get discontent is because they're not happy and they're putting their happiness in things that are not of God. Are you with me? It's just that simple. And so, trust me, even if you had paradise, if you didn't have a spiritual mindset, you still wouldn't be satisfied here. You still give into selfishness and greed. Are you with me right there? And so, here in Jude, we have a lot to learn. In Jude, verse 11, let's see what the Bible says here. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. Let's see what he says in verse 11. It says, woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Wow. Okay. I, I like the scripture because it gives me a warning about what we're going to talk about today. And so the title of the message is simply, The Way of Cain. Well, I, when, when, I, when I first read this in June, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the perfect sermon title. The Way of Cain. Because it just sounds ominous. I mean, it's, it's intense, you know? And so what's convicting about this is that we see that the way of Cain is not to be admired. It's not to be tolerated. God views it here as the way to destruction. Are you with me? And so we got to have deep conviction as we study out Cain in Genesis today. Now, let's turn over to Je Genesis chapter 4. And as you turn there, really the question you have to ask yourself is, what road are you traveling down? Because it says the way of Cain. You know, Cain didn't just wake up that way. It was a process. It was a road he traveled to get to the what he eventually did. And this is, this is really how Satan gets us. Satan will not get you by, you know, um, just saying, boom, in your face. And then, no, he knows you're smarter than that, right? You're, 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 if, if you are here this morning, you are, have a God-fearing heart. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And so Satan knows. He's like, eh, I'm not going to get you by just, like, trying to slap you with sin. No, I'm going to leave the little breadcrumbs here for you to follow <laughs> that will pull you right on in. Are you with me here? Take a look here in Genesis chapter 4. Amen. Amen. Let's start reading in verse 1. It says, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. Now, it's interesting. The word Cain in the Hebrew means brought forth or acquired, right? So she's probably fired up that, you know, the Lord brought forth a son, and she named him Cain. The word Cain in of itself is not a bad thing. It's what he ended up doing, Amen. Well, it says, she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. There is the, the definition of Cain right there. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Okay. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions. 
from some of the firstborn of his flock. You know, last night we had a pretty awesome bride. We had the briar master here, uh, Mr. Jacques Grunewald. And it was interesting because you could see him, man, he was just going at it. He had, he had the, the chicken. This is my first real bride since living here. And, you know, you had the, the chicken with the, the beer stuff, cider things going on, marination. You had the whole uh, beautiful. Biravos, um, I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna get there. Biravos, he was, he was, he was working it out. And I was thinking, you know, all the guys were. It was interesting because um, I really appreciate him trying to help us have the kids eat first. And all the brothers were just circling like wolves, where they were just like waiting. Whoa. And then, 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 you know, the the women ate first, and then the brothers were just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they're just circling. And it, it was interesting because I'm like, imagine if you wait all that time. And I've learned that you know here, brides in South Africa are allowed to. Um, I appreciate. My brother Nick, because he was explaining to me how this works. In the U.S., you have a barbecue. If you say we're going to the barbecue, right? You come over. You can. By the time you come over, the barbecue is ready. It's it's ready to go. You know. Like, so, and, but in South Africa, it's different. You know, if they tell you the bride's going to start at five o'clock, you're probably not going to eat until about six, six thirty. And so, so it's interesting because Nick was telling me his story of, uh, of a fellow U.S. minister who came to his first bride, and he was like, "Okay, I'm going to be there at five o'clock, right?" And so he comes, and he's like, "Okay," and he's like, "Now," and, and so he tells him, "Now the bride can start. I'm going to put on the fire." And he's like. Now I'm going to put on the fire. <laughs> I mean, I came here hungry, ready to eat, right? And so, and so and after an hour, he starts feeding salad to himself. He's like tearing up the salad. But why am I sharing all this? Because obviously there are different expectations, but I understand the fellowship that's trying to be built right there. I get that. But imagine after waiting all that time for food, and then you get your portion, and it's like one little half piece of leg, you know, a little bit of salad, and that's it. After waiting all that time. How would you feel, right? Probably feel pretty, pretty your, your stomach is grumbling. You start eating chips because you're like, you yeah, had no meat here. In the same way, imagine how God felt. And it's like, here's Cain. And after giving him all this, he, he literally brings just some of the fruits of the soil. While Cain, of, well, Abel rather, brought the fat portions. And what's convicting about this too, you look at this and you realize, wow. Um, it says, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was saddened about his sin and really was eager to repent, right? Is that what it says? See, we're a Bible church. I want to make sure you're paying attention right here. So what happens? It says, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. You ever get downcast? You ever get angry? Oh boy, you're starting down the way of Cain. Right. So the first point today is that the way of Cain is the way of rebellion. Come on, bro. Come on. The way of rebellion. You know, what do we see here? Abel is probably a shepherd. Cain, a farmer, bought both brothers, brought offerings to the Lord. And again, we know this passage. We know why Cain's offering was rejected. Right. Cain brought some. Abel brought uh, his best. But the issue here is not what we know about what happened here. The issue is that. Cain was not ignorant. Cain knew what he should have done. It's not like Cain didn't know, oh, I'm only, I'm, 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 I'm supposed to bring only a part. No, he knew he was supposed to give his best to God. Come on, Andrew. He wasn't ignorant. Are you with me right here? But instead, he was, in, instead of um, being wholehearted, he was defiant. He was rebellious. Instead of giving God his best, he held back. He allowed his selfishness and his greed to control him. And you have to ask yourself, wow, as Christians today, are we giving our best to God in our sacrifice? Because we may not be giving um, fruits or a lamb to the Lord, right? Let's see what we're supposed to give him. Turn over to Romans 12. Let's take a look at what we should be giving. What kind of sacrifice... Should we be giving the Lord? Amen. Let's see what the Bible says. Because, I mean, I don't have any, like, lambs or goats or, you know, some sweet potatoes in the back that I have to sacrifice an altar. So what exactly am I supposed to be giving? In Romans 12, let's see what the Bible says. Right, bro. Come on. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, sisters, in view of God's mercy. And he does show us mercy. Amen, family? Amen. Amen. To offer what? To offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So the, the question here is not, it's not about, oh, well, I, I just want to give a No, God's like, I want you. I don't just want your money. 
I don't want your time. I want you. Okay. I want your heart. I want you. I want all of you. Come on, bro. I mean, I think about Osas and Ariel getting ready to get married here very soon. Come on. Imagine if the bride goes to, uh, you know, her, her groom and says, you know what? I, I do care about you. So I'm going to give you five days out of the week. Actually, you know what? Yeah, you know, I think that's good. That's good. Five days out of the week. But the other two days, I got to really keep from me because I got to do me. Can you imagine? Or if someone says, you know what? I love you, but I'm going to give you two days out of the week. The other five days, gosh, I mean, I mean, who's going to take care of me? But yet, that's what people do. Christians, what do they do? They come to church on Sunday think, ah, God, I'm giving you all. Well, actually, you're giving him about two hours. And then you want to go back to doing what you were doing before, but to kind of check church off your list, right? That's what the world does. They give God two hours out of the week, and the other hundred of hours throughout the week, they're like, well, I'm going to do my thing. I got to take care of me. And don't tell me that I'm not a Christian because I've given my two hours. Oh, and by the way, I gave some contribution too. So you should be happy with that. I gave you my time. I even got up early and put on some nice clothes. I had to go dry clean these things. Are you with me right here? And so guys, we've got to have some deep conviction here. How rebellious are you? You know what God says you should do. And yet you say, all right, fine. All right, fine. I'm going to give him some. I'm going to give him some. And just like Cain, you give him some. But you haven't given him everything. You give him some obedience. Parents, you know when your child is partially obedient. Oh, oh, oh. All right, Isaiah, I need you to come here right now. I'm coming. I'm coming. No, no, stop coming and come right now. Are you with me right here? There's, there's no partial. Partial obedience is disobedience. Are you with me here? And I mean, we got to have some deep conviction about all this, guys. You know, I look at this passage and I realize, wow, God is saying you have to offer your bodies. You have to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. God, his mercy, God is so merciful. He says, you know what? I'm going to let you keep living. I'm going to let you keep. Yeah, I know you have nothing to do with your heart, nothing to do with your lungs. No, I'm going to let you keep living. I just want you to be, to live as a sacrifice for me. Holy, pleasing for me, for God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Not coming on Sundays and singing for, two, singing for a couple hours and then going home. That's not worship alone. Day in, day out, the Christian life, yes. that is worship. Are you with me, church? Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. Guys, that's the way it needs to be. But you have to ask yourself, has that been your life this week? Have you really trying to be like Jesus this week? If you're studying the Bible with friends, let's get together. Let's, let's study out discipleship. Let's learn what it means to yes. be a Christian daily. Because if you don't really understand what it means to be a disciple daily, then you really don't know what it means to worship God. Yeah. Yes. Are you with me here, family? Yes. And so, um, for us, I mean, I, I always talk to people, they're like, man, I die for God. I love God. I'm like, man, you can't even get to church and you talk about dying for God. You, you don't even give your contribution, but you're talking about dying for God. You can't even die to the immorality and purity in your life, but you talk about I would die for God. You, you, you're clueless, man. You, you, you're, you're self-deceived. You don't, you don't appreciate what it means to really worship God. And I had to realize this for myself. I grew up going to church where no one taught me what it meant to be to die daily to my sin, to really be a true disciple. And so if you're a guest here today, I want to encourage you, study the Bible. <laughs> Don't stop giving God the way of king. This, this partial obedience, which is really disobedience. Yes. Amen, family? Amen. But one of the things I also realize is that when we stop trying to please God with all our heart, I see you, bro. Right? We start getting this got-to attitude versus get-to attitude. I got to go to church. I got to read my Bible. I got to share my faith. I got to get open about my sin versus, whoa, I get to get up early in the morning. I get to spend time with God. You know, on our way here this morning, Amen. I was taken, um, we were, uh, when would you call the, uh, the boat, the guy who picked us up this morning was a very, very religious Muslim. Very religious. His car was white. He was dressed in a white, like full um, regalia, had the prayer beads, everything going on. Inside his car, he was like, it's almost like everything was covered with like some kind of towel or, or some kind of thing to protect the seats. Like he's like, he wanted his car to stay, remain pure. Wow. 
we walk, we come in, you know. And of course, I, I knew exactly who he was. So I look up, I see like uh, like a, a Islamic prayer journal. I see the Quran, but you can't tell it's the Quran because he's wrapped it up. I'm like, okay. So we're, we're driving. Come on, bro. And so, you know, you got to start the conversation. <laughs> you know, right? You, gotta, you, you don't say, well, okay, he's Muslim, so I'm not going to reach out to him. No, I'm going to reach out to him. So uh, I was like, well, it's been an early morning for you, huh? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, yeah, I got up early myself, up, so up at five, you know, spent some time in prayer, trying to really spend time worshiping God. He's like, oh, you pray? I was like, yeah, of course, I'm a Christian minister. He's like, yeah, I, I pray too. I, I, I pray, and I pray for God to help me understand, you know, the, through the Quran, what I must do to, 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 to uh, live a righteous life. Wow. This guy is up at 4.30 in the morning and happy to do so. Praying to Allah. Are you with me here? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take it. Go on, go on. So I'm like, um, well, you know, have you ever studied? I, 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 first of all, I said to him, you know, I have a copy of the Quran as well. He said, you read the Quran? I'm like, yeah, I've read the Quran. Now, of course, I didn't tell him that I actually read the Quran to be able to break down all the false doctrines in there, but we'll get to that part later. I'm like, do you know that in the Quran, in Surah chapter 3, it talks about um, reading the Bible or reading the, the scriptures of the people of the book? He's like, I said, have you ever read the Bible? He's like, no. You, you should. Surah 3 says you should read it. I was like, you know, you can come Wednesdays at 6.30. We have Bible studies here. Come on. Nice. Guys, I got to ask you, like, if a Muslim is eager to get up at 4.30 in the morning and happy to do so, praying that, God will, that Allah will give him insight, mm. how, how zealous are you? To get up early in the morning. Preach, bro. Are you in right here? Yeah, I don't know how early you got up this morning, but sometimes people think, well, I don't have to have my quiet time on Sundays because the preacher's going to give me my quiet time. Yeah. I hope you're getting up early in the morning having time with God for you. I have my quiet time in addition to what I'm preaching you. This is not my quiet time. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Family, if the world, does the world have more conviction than you to have a relationship with God? Come on, bro. Preach. And so, do you have a get-to attitude or a got-to attitude? Come on, bro. Right? Do you feel, I get to read my Bible. I get to share my faith. And this is huge because very often, we can just do the minimum. And that's what Cain did. That's the way of Cain. It's the way of doing the minimum to get by. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Come on, bro. You see, the Bible says we are a sold-out movement. Amen? Amen. That's what we're called to be. Matthew 13 says he sold everything he had, bought that field. That's where the whole sold out movement comes from. Yeah. Matthew 13. People say, all oh, of you guys calling yourself sold out. I'm like, uh, actually, if you read the Bible in Matthew 13, it says that he sold everything he had and bought that field. It's biblical, guys. But here in Matthew chapter 5, let's see what the Bible says now. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Maybe you think you can just do the minimum and make it to heaven. Amen. Preach, bro. That's like... I mean, I, I don't know how my wife would be encouraged if I just did the minimum to be a husband. Wow. Mm. Would you be encouraged, sweetie? No, no she wouldn't be. Amen? Amen? And so imagine, like, seriously. Okay, you know what? I'm going to go. Here, here, Wife, Valentine's Day, here you go, flowers. Money, go shopping. Are you happy? Good. Is that what you want? No. Guys. Have you given God your heart? What if God were to say, what about our relationship? What have you done? All right, Sunday service, here you go. Contra, here, take. I, I didn't give it all, here, here. Imagine. Matthew chapter five, what does the Bible say here? Come on, bro. Jesus here is talking to the crowds. And we gotta have deep conviction when it comes to not just giving the minimum. Here, the Bible reads in Matthew chapter five, verse 20. All right, we can start in verse 19. It says, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You know, that's, that's interesting right there. A lot of people believe that all you have to do to be a Christian is just believe. You don't have to help anybody else. My Bible tells me here in verse 19, it says, whoever practices and, and teaches these commands. Will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Are you a teacher? Who have you taught the Bible to this week? Guys, 
A disciple makes disciples, baptizes them, and teaches them to obey everything. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Are you with me here? Yes. A lot of people just think being a Christian is, I believe in God, I'm good to go. No! If you know the truth, you must help others. That is why we've given up everything to leave the U.S. to come here. Actually, via Legos. <laughs> right? But look at what it says in verse 20. It says, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Whoa. See, the Pharisees, with all their 643 different Old Testament laws, they followed the book of the law, book of the law, follow, legality, follow, follow. And they thought that by doing all that legal stuff, following the, the, the rule of the law, but not giving their hearts, they'll be fine. And a lot of people think they'll be fine just by checking off church off the list. Oh, I've read my Bible today. Check. I prayed. Check. But have you really given God your heart? Are you with me here, family? And this is something for me that, like we talked about, it's a, it's a, you see how humble you are, like we talked about at midweek, looking at do you have an attitude of self-righteousness in your life? Where you think, I'm a, I'm, I'm a good guy because I know the Bible and, yeah, I even teach people. Preach, I know the Bible. I, I teach people, too. I'm doing pretty awesome. I like this guy over here. Wow. Preach. Constantly comparing yourself. It's scary. Amen? Amen? And so let's go back to here. You know, it's interesting. When Cain in Genesis gets uh, rebuked by, well, excuse me. Let me, let me, let me, let me back up a bit. Cain... Once he sees that his offering was not accepted by God, how does he react? He gets angry. Have you ever gotten angry when someone points out something you've done wrong? I, I, I've done that. <laughs> right? uh, who hasn't, right? And I'm like, man, this is convicting. Because I know in my marriage, I am so grateful to my wife. My wife has, been, has put up with me for 14 years. And I pray that I've, I've tried to keep it in some ways comfortable for her. Amen. Amen. I love you very much, sweetie. Um, I think it's amazing to think that, you know, one of the ways I know I, I see my sin, if you want to know my sin, just talk to my wife. Because my wife knows me better than anybody else. Right? Welcome. Amen. Very soon. Right? And so what's good about that, it's good and it's great. Because it's like, well, it's good and it's, it's, good and it's great, actually. Because, uh, <laughs> because she will help me to see things I cannot see. So one of the areas that I know I need to work on is when my wife sees something in me, I got to be like, man, I got to really love this. But the problem is that we can start to justify our sin, which I'm going to talk about later. But instead of getting angry, instead of getting a downcast face, we should be happy. How do you react when someone points out your sin? Turn over to Romans 12. Sorry, Proverbs 12. Excuse me. You know, uh, Proverbs 12 is a great scripture. It's a great scripture because it shows how our rebellion happens. In Romans 12, it says, verse 1. I keep saying Romans. Proverbs 12, verse 1. Oh, <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing this Roman series in Lagos. That's why they just finished it up. Amen. In Proverbs 12, verse 1, the Bible reads, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But he who hates correction is? Stupid. What does it say? Stupid. The word stupid is in the Bible. Is that shocking? You know, when a kid say, don't say stupid. And, and, you know, our kids were like, well, actually, daddy, stupid is in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. <laughs> it is in the Bible. But you have to ask yourself, wow, how do you react when someone challenges you? This, this is huge for us, guys. You know, going back to Cain here, I think the challenge for us this morning is where are we? Do we really have a rebellious heart? Are we on the road of rebellion? We know what's right. We know what we need to do, but we choose to do what's wrong anyway. And then when it gets pointed out, we get angry. We have the audacity to get angry on top of it. And then our face is downcast. That's why when Chris went around and said, hey, how you doing this morning? Right? All of a sudden, people are like, <laughs> they want to get all happy. I'm like, oh, you should have been like that walking in here. Whoa. That's right. Which means that if you're not happy, there's a reason. Yeah. Now, have you dealt with that reason? Don't put up a fake face. You know when people smile, you're like, but their eyes aren't smiling. You know what's on right there? You know when you smile? 
and your eyes are not smiling. You know when someone's smiling. You know in their heart, right? And so Proverbs 15, 13, a happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. And so we got to make sure, find out where your attitude is this morning and get help, get open. Amen? Let's keep reading. Genesis 4. Come on. First point, the way of Cain is the way of rebellion. One of rebellion. Point number two, the way of Cain is one of resentment. This is why Cain got angry. This is why his face was downcast. Look what happens next in verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching. You ever see someone crouch? They're trying to, they're trying to like, they, they don't want you to see them, but you can see them, right? So sin is crouching. It's like, how can I get at you? It's crouching at your door. He wants to get in. It desires to what? To have you. But you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, hey, let's go out to the field. Let's take it outside. Right? And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. You know, the word in the, in the Hebrew here is, it, it's, it's savage what he did to him. It wasn't just like, boom. no, no, no. Of course, he didn't have guns back in those days. But it wasn't like just, it was savage. Like, literally, the resentment had built up in him so much that he literally slaughtered, in the Hebrew, his brother. He slaughtered his brother. And let's stop here for a quick moment. So you look at this, and you're like, well, where does this resentment come in? Have you ever... You know, you know when you're a kid and you're doing bad things, but there's always a one good kid that's doing the right thing. And you look at him, you're like, oh, you're such a goody two shoes. Right? And now all of a sudden you got this resentment, like, or when you're in school and like everyone like got like uh, out of 50, they got like 55. That was that was the mean. But there's this one guy that gets like a 90. You're like, oh, you miss up the mean for everybody. <laughs> right? Yeah. Resentment. Is there anyone that you resent right now? Is there anyone in your heart? You know, sometimes we compare ourselves to others. This person has what you want, and every time you see them, resentment. Could be a possession, could be a car, could be a spouse, could be whatever. Are you with me right here, guys? This is huge. This is huge. And what's convicting about this is that his self-righteousness and rebellion led to resentment. Because he was rebellious. He knew what he should have done. He knew that he should have given God his best. But because he's prideful, he's like, nah, whatever. I'm just going to give him some. But then on top of that, because he's so prideful, now he thinks he deserves to be resentful. Are you with me right here? You, you feel like I'm justified in being resentful. So, and, and, and what's crazy about this is that the devil didn't influence him. You know how sometimes people try to say, the devil made me do it. Yeah. Oh my God. Give me a break. Are you really serious? No, the devil didn't make you do it. You did it. Come on, bro. You did stop, stop blowing. No, you did it. And what's convicting is that, you know, before, you know, the devil was like, Eve, did God really say? Right? But this time, Satan's just like, yeah. just watching. Preach, bro. I mean, honestly, he's like, what you going to do, Cain? <laughs> right? That's it. And he, <laughs> can you imagine? I think sometimes when you're in sin, the devil's just there looking at you like, <laughs> eating your pizza, just watching you. What are you going to do? Wow. What are you going to do? Come on, bro. You're giving a show for Satan. Come on. Wow. And so Satan was not the instigator. It was his willful decision. What sin is mastering you this morning? What sin is making you, get, getting into your, into, just getting a grip on you because of your rebellion and you making excuses for it? Preach, bro. And so, I know this morning, maybe it's cowardice. Mm. Maybe it's cowardice. Maybe if it was you in that um, bolt this morning, you'd been like, ah, I don't want to talk to this guy. He's a Muslim. Maybe it'd been unbelief. Well, even if I talk to him, he won't believe. Wow. You get what I'm saying? Sure. Maybe it's impurity. Maybe you were looking at things you shouldn't have been looking at this week. Maybe it was unforgiveness. 
this week. You just Maybe you're just stuck. You're like, man, I know I need to forgive him. I know I need to forgive her. But you're rebellious. Like, no! Oh. I will not forgive! Sure. And God's like, hmm, should I forgive you? Because you, you, you got this state of rebellion, I'm not going to forgive. And then you get resentful, like, yeah, he deserves my unforgiveness. She deserves my unforgiveness. You see how the way of Cain, right? You chose not to act in love, and now their sin has made you sin. Because I think sometimes the way that people justify their sin is like, oh, well, you sin first. That's like, it's so childish. Because it's like, if a child does a stupid thing or a foolish thing to the parent, does the parent now say, you, and now have the justification to react towards the child? No, you don't do that. Because you're the adult. So who's going to be the adult in this issue? Who's going to be the adult and say, I'll forgive you? Oh, and by the way, like I said last week, I won't be like, I forgive you. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I'm like, I forgive you. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's easy. Come on, bro. But you got to be willing to be like, I forgive you. And I want to show you mercy right now because I know God forgives me. And who am I? So I'm going to forgive you. Guys, this is huge. You know, the story of Cain and Abel, I want to give you some some meat and potatoes this morning. It's not just the, the story of murder, but it's the story of the development of anger. Psychologists tell us there's several stages and phases of anger. Um, the stages actually are mild irritation. You're irritated by someone, okay? The second stage is indignation. Now, they call this a righteous anger, like, this is wrong, right? Then number three is wrath. Number four is fury. And number five is rage, where it's just blind. Those are the five, psychologists say, are the five uh, stages or phases of anger. Wow. Are you with me right here? Come on, brother. That's why the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. You can be irritated and not be sinful. Yep. Are you with me here? Come on, right? Um, you can be indignant and not be sinful. But when you get to that wrath part, oh boy, watch out. Wrath, fury, rage. Whoa. You're losing more and more control. And so, like I said, self-control decreases as the phases progress. And as I said, when Cain attacked and killed Abel in the field, the, the Hebrew word for killed describes very, a very violent death. It literally meant to destroy. Imagine slaughtering your own brother. And that kind of anger didn't happen overnight. It's a slow boiling anger. You ever, have, you ever see a gas stove? You know when you turn on the gas stove, right? And you see the flames? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what a lot of people have is like this low-grade anger. It's like when you take the gas and it's like, it's coming out, but it's like, right? It's not. It's, and people, a lot of people walk around just like that with a low-grade anger. It's low-grade. It's like they'll smile at you. Hi, how you doing? But they got this low-grade anger that is like right there. And if you do something, it just pops off. Yeah. And you wonder how people just like, like I was watching this investigation discovery thing the other day. And these guys went into the gas, uh, this gas station, got some stuff. We're coming out. A guy was on the phone and literally said, hey, guys, can I get a ride? They were like, no. And, he's, and he said, ah, oh, forget you. Oops, use some bad word. And the guy was like, what did you say to me? And because of that, the guy goes after him, beats him down, takes, you know they have like wood, usually cut up wood at gas stations to use for fires, takes the wood, bam, I mean literally destroy, they beat him down where he dies on the gas station lot. Wow, that's intense. Firewood embedded in his head. Wow. Killed him with firewood. That is the kind of anger. That you don't see, you think, oh, these guys are fine. And you don't know what's going on with people. Are you with me right here? And so, it, it, it's scary, guys. It is scary. Where are you this morning? Where are you in the stages of anger this morning? Do you have a mild irritation going on? 
Indignation, wrath, fury, rage, you probably wouldn't even be in here, right? Fury, yeah, you probably wouldn't be in here either. But some of y'all may have some wrath going on. Preach, bro. You may have some wrath going on that you're hiding. You're like pushing it down. Because you know if it, if it comes out, whoa. Take a look over in Job. I want to show you something. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Just Trying to break it down here, guys. Down. It's always right. important to study things deeply that you already know. Because, you know, how many times have we read Cain and Abel? Right? But to really get deeper and get insight into this stuff and apply it to your life, that's the key. You know, in Job 36, Elihu is kind of the young guy is trying to help Job right here. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes we're resentful towards God. Yes, come on. Let's just talk about it. Come on, bro. Right? Is, on, maybe bro. you're afraid to say that, but it's true, right? Amen. In Job 36, verse 5, the Bible reads, God is mighty, but does not despise men. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their rights. He does not take his eyes off the righteous. He enthrones them with kings and exalts them forever. But if men are bound by chains, held fast by cause of affliction, he tells them what they have done, that they've sinned arrogantly. He makes them listen to correction and commands them to repent of their evil. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. But if they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. The godless in heart harbor resentment. Are you godless this morning? The godless in heart harbor resentment. Even when he fetters them, they do not cry for help. You know, sometimes you're angry, and instead of going to get help, you're like, I'm going to stay in my anger. I'm not going to get open with nobody. I'm just going to stay in my anger. That's, that's godless. Because, you know, God is trying to help you to, to get help. They will not cry for help. They're too prideful. It goes in verse 15. But those who suffer, he delivers in their suffering. He speaks to them in their affliction. Do you realize that God is trying to speak to you through some of the toughest times of your life? He's trying to mold you and shape you to be the man and woman he wants you to be if you let him. Are you with me here, family? Amen. You know, um, when we see that affliction comes and even assistance from God is delayed, there is a purpose. Yeah. It's to alert the righteous to their sins and lead them to repentance. God does speak to us through adversity, family. Amen. If we're humble, we'll learn. If we're not, we'll also learn. Yeah. Amen. And so how does this apply to you? Is there anyone, even in this church, in this room, outside this room, that you have resentment towards? I want to encourage you to get open today. Amen. But get open with a humble heart. Get open not with a self-righteousness of, you did this to me. No. No. You get open and say, you know what, man? I just want to be honest with you. I remember calling some brothers one time and said, guys, bro, I just want to let you know. I, you don't even remember this. But I want to get open because I, uh, you did such and such to me. And um, it just it bothered me, man. And I, I want to apologize for having this anger in my heart towards you for so long. Now, of course, the brother's like, bro, I didn't even know. I'm so sorry. Really? I did that? I'm so sorry. Now, of course, I wasn't doing this for his apology. Because if you do things for people's apology, then it's more about you than God. Yeah. Right. But, you know, he was like, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, please forgive me. I'm like, bro, I'm sorry. I'm the one that shouldn't have held on to this for so long. Now we're done. We're good to go. Are you with me here? Right. Forgive right. and forget. The forget part is not the easy, is usually the hard part. Are you with me right there? Um, but I think, you know, as I said, maybe this morning there's resentment towards God with prayers that haven't been answered. Maybe there is resentment towards God with people who haven't responded to you. You've poured out your lives to people and they haven't responded. Maybe there are people that have hurt you in the past. Deal with it, family. Get on your knees and cry out to God. Don't let resentment hold your heart captive. Amen? Amen. Let's get back to Genesis and close on out. Come on, bro. Preach. Come on. The way of Cain. Amen. Amen. The way of destruction. Mm. It is a warning for us all. The way of Cain is the way of rebellion, the way of resentment. And the last one is the way of Cain is to reject responsibility. Now, why do I say that? Well, look, look and see what happens next. 
In verse 9, the Bible reads this. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? <laughs> Don't you love God? God is great. He, he, he really, he, ans yeah. he asks questions even though he knows exactly. He knows exactly what's happened. Why does he do that? Because he wants you to acknowledge it. That's the issue. He gives you rope. He's like, yeah, I mean, I've been in discipling times where I know exactly what's going on. Right? But I'm talking to the person, so bro, can you help me understand this? I, I already know what's going on. But I act like I don't. Like Jesus on the road to Emmaus. So what's, you know, what, what's, what's going on? What happened here? <laughs> they both got, God does that a lot. Because he, he does that because he wants you, to, you want, he already knows, but he wants you to acknowledge what's really going on. And so here in verse 9, the Bible reads, Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Wow. Oof. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land and I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's stop there. The way of Cain is to reject responsibility. So did Cain accept responsibility for his brother? No, no. Of course not. And because he rejected his brother, God rejected him. So... Interesting here, the Hebrew word for, in verse 9, he says, am I my brother's keeper? The word keeper means to take care of, right? So here, you see that in verse 9? He says, am I my brother's keeper? The word keeper in the Hebrew means to take care of. Like, in, um, and you know in Genesis 2.15 where it says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it, right? Same word. To take care of means to guard, to protect, to watch, to keep safe. And so when God asked him, where is your brother Abel? What he really was saying is, I don't know where Abel my brother is. Am I supposed to take care of him? Am I supposed to tend him, guard him, protect him, watch him, keep him safe, care for him? Preach. That's what he was saying. Yeah. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And so instead of being his brother's keeper, he became his brother's murderer. Take a look over in 1 Thessalonians 2. You know, I'm grateful to be a part of a movement of churches that believes in discipling. I'm grateful to be a part of churches that believe that we need to be in each other's lives. Because most people, they go to church, they come, they listen, they leave. There is no relationships. Jesus sent them out two by two. They're like, you're lucky if the person even talks to you at church. Are you with me here? That's why we have, in our family, we, every single person has a discipling partner. Someone in their life to keep them faithful and accountable. In 1 Thessalonians 2, we see that this was the heart of the ministry in these early churches. They were a family. Wow, come on. Take a look at what it says here, 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 7, it says, But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. We want to know your life. I want you to know my life. Yeah. It's not just come to church, hi, peace be with you, also with you, goodbye. <laughs> Let's talk. Let's get open. Yes. Let's talk about marriage. Let's talk about friendships. Yeah. Let's talk about hurts and pains. Let's get real. Yeah. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. It says we were delighted not only to share the gospel, but our lives as well, because you have become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And the church said, Amen. Amen. That's the way it needs to be. Is this what we have? Is this what you've allowed others to be in your life? You know, you got to be willing to take responsibility for where you're at today. Because when you stand before God, nobody else is going to be there. It's going to be you and God. 
And you can't say, well, it's his fault. No, it was her fault. And the reason why we don't, re- re- we don't uh, accept responsibility is because we justify. So, for example, in my sin, I'm just, I like to get open about my sin, too. So, in my sin, just talk to my wife. One of the ways that I have to work on is defensiveness. Because what will happen is, um, and I'm sure marrieds, you don't struggle with this at all. But, you know, what happens is sometimes when someone tells you something, and it's right on. You don't like the way they said it. They, they may not have said it a wrong way. But to you, you don't like the way they say it. So as a result of you now not liking the way they say it, now you try to you, you push off the issue that came up. And now the issue is, well, I didn't like how you said that. Do you get what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe okay, he doesn't, he doesn't, you don't relate. No, it's all right, it's all right, maybe, you know, it's okay. But guys, this is it. And that's how these arguments start. And instead, God's not glorified because instead of just accepting responsibility for what you did, right, and apologizing, now you feel like you need to justify yourself. And that's my sin. I can justify myself in that place. I didn't like that. Or maybe I haven't considered this. Are you with me here? Yeah. Amen. Hopefully that's helpful. Amen. I, I turn over to 1 John 4. Um, you know, are we really accepting the responsibility and the reality of being each other's keepers? Preach, bro. This is huge, guys. You know, I really want to hold up just uh, in so many ways. Jacques and Jeanette, they, they've just been such a great example of this. They have. They've been a great job. I mean, they have poured out their lives. For the, I mean, I mean, it, it was awesome last night to be able to have the bride. And it was so encouraging. But they're thinking about how to support and how to encourage us. You know, that, that, that's the heart of a shepherd in training. That, that's, that's someone that really wants to give their best. You know, to, to be that keeper. And for four years... Not on staff. Come on, Joe. Not on staff. For four years pouring out their lives for this church. Well done. Well done. And so, in the same way, family, we, we got to see here that we got to really check our own hearts. Amen. First John 4. Let's see what the Bible says here. Come on, Are we accepting the responsibility of being each other's brother and sister? Because it's not just being their keeper. We're supposed to love our brother. If you love someone, then it's not being their keeper is not an issue. Because you love them. Are you with me here? Yes. Right? Um, and by hurting our brothers and sisters, we hurt God. Take a look at 1 John 4 here. What does the Bible say here in verse 20 and 21? It says, well, you can, actually, you can start in verse 19. It says, we love because he first loved us. You know the reason why people can't forgive easily? is because they don't appreciate the forgiveness of God. You know why people don't love easily? It's because they don't appreciate the love of God. They say they do. In their minds, they really think they get it, but they don't. Because if they did, then they wouldn't be so focused on what people have done to them. They wouldn't be so focused on taking people's sin on them personally. This is huge. You learn this a lot in marriage, too. Instead of taking people's sins personally, you take it to heart. The issue is not about, it's not even about me. You've hurt God. I've hurt God. We need to get on our knees and ask for forgiveness from God instead of being so focused on each other. Amen. First John 4, verse 20, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, hates his sister, maybe even struggles with their spouse, he's a liar. Preach. She's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, his sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother and sister. Do you love God this morning? Come on, bro. And is that shown by your actions? Amen. Guys, let me tell you, there is no sin that is done to you that you shouldn't be able to forgive. Amen. I'm so proud of my wife. You know, um, it's one thing to be hurt by people in the world. It's another thing to be hurt by people in the kingdom. You know, when you're hurt by people in the kingdom, it hurts deeper because you're like, you should know better. You should, you should, I mean, seriously? Like, those are the ones that really hurt deeply. But the good news is that we can always go to the cross. The good news is we can remember that, wow, I will be a spiritual doormat to give glory to God. I will be like Jesus. And I appreciate my wife because there are times where 
women did things to my wife that honestly, it, it infuriated me. Come on, Patrick. But I appreciate my wife having the maturity to say, you know what? I'm going to go to God, I'm going to forgive, and I'm going to move forward. Amen. I'm not going to let resentment get into my life. I'm not going to let rebellion get into my life. I am going to accept the responsibility that I am your keeper. I am your women's ministry leader, and I will serve you even as you hurt me. Come on, Patrick. That's my wife. That's my wife. That is the cup of leadership. And, you know, for us here today, you know, I just to be real with you, I, I, I know I had to fight to love. Um, there have been times where I didn't want to love people. Come on, just be honest with you, you know? Because you, know, you know, it's like the whole thing of, bro, I love you, I just don't like you. You ever been there with people? Yeah. I love you. I know I'm commanded to love you. I just don't like you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you don't relate to what I'm saying. But that's right. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to keep it real, okay? I'm not just giving you the Bible. I'm talking real life. Yes. Okay, Come because, um, guys, I'm telling you, it, it, it's the only one that's hurting you. Hurting is you. Yes. Take a look back. Go, go flip back a page. First John 3. That's good, bro. Come on. First John 3. Um, you know, Cain was trying to excuse his personal responsibilities for the relationship with his brother. And we can try to excuse our ungodly anger. But I don't care how you look at it or how you condone it or how you explain it. It's inexcusable. You may say, oh, it's, it's, it's understandable. Yeah, it's understandable, but it's not acceptable. Right? Um, no, two wrongs don't make a right. We all know it. No. Hmm. Take a look at 1 John 3. It says in verse 11, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain. There he is again. You know, Cain is just in different parts of the Bible, but it, 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 you, can, you can think it's only in Genesis. No, his example was so intense, it made it to the New Testament. Wow. Do not be like Cain, wow. who belonged to the evil one. Wow. When you allow your anger to result in rebellion, resentment, and you reject responsibility, you are literally belonging to the evil one. And then it says, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil. And his brothers were righteous. You know, um, so often, you know, like what's, that, what's that quote? Misery loves company. Yeah. When you're miserable, you want other people to be miserable too. And if they're not miserable, it's like, oh, I'm going to make you miserable. Come on, bro. It's just wickedness. Guys, and so how do we stay focused? By not rejecting responsibility, by having people in our lives to keep us accountable. Last scripture I'll give you, Hebrews chapter 3. Last scripture I'll give you. The way of Cain, family. Let's heed Jude's admonition to us. Hebrews 3, what does the Bible say? How do we protect ourselves from the way of Cain? Hebrews 3, verse 12 and 13. See to it, brothers and sisters. You ever get tired of the scripture? I hope not. Because the Bible says, see to it. Yes, go on. Amen. See to it that what? None of you. Yeah. You ever look around and realize there's some of you that have issues, yeah. but you do nothing? Mm-hmm. Because you're not thinking, I am my brother's keeper. Wow. Wow. I am my sister's keeper. Someone else will do it. Wow. Maybe their discipling partner will take care of them. Mm-hmm. If you see it, if you see something, say something. Okay. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. So this is more than just, oh, I saw my brother looking at porn, or oh, I saw my, my, my that sister struggling with greed or selfishness or whatever. That's like, it's not just obvious sin. I'm talking unbelief. That's a deep sin to walk to see. A person who's struggling just to believe that God will do what he said he's going to do. That's dangerous. See, there was none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another every Sunday. No. 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 What does it say? Daily. Daily. As long as it's called today, as long as we're still in the grace of God, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin was deceitful to Cain. He didn't even see it. He couldn't even see it. Even though he knew what he needed to do. And as a result, his heart got what? Harder and harder 
and harder to the point where he slaughtered his own brother. Come on, brother, preach. You, you, you got to have a hard heart yeah. to do something like that. Yeah. Where, I mean, you know, people, you know, again, if I wasn't a, a minister or a doctor, I'd probably be a detective. I'm watching these ID shows, Investigation Discovery, and it's interesting, you know, the people, you, you look at killings that happen in the world between people who really love each other, it's not just gunfire. No, 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 no. That's too easy. It's manual strangulation. It's like, you know how hard it is to strangle someone to death while they're looking at you? I mean, that's how, how hard do you have to be? And in the same way, sometimes spiritually, you are strangling other people and killing them because you don't want to forgive them. Come on, bro. We don't see it in oh, the, the, the spiritual parallels are very real. Come on, bro. And we say, ah, all right, I'm not doing anything. No, no, no. You are the quiet, the, the, the silent treatment, mm. the coldness. You're doing it purposely. And you know you're doing it. That's the sad thing about it. We've got to love the way Jesus loved. Oh. Because if we don't, anger will rob us, like it did Cain, from the presence of the Lord. I'll leave you with these quotes. You know, someone once said, speak when you're angry and you'll deliver the best speech you'll ever regret. (laughs) (laughs) Speak when you're angry and you'll deliver the best speech you'll ever regret. I've learned that when someone says I need some time, give them some time. Give them some time. Let them calm down. Let them cool down. Because if you explode into rage, what you say and what you do is unrecoverable. You can cry, you can apologize, but it cannot be undone. Because that person will always remember what you did. And it will always be in the back of their minds. How did that person lose such self-control to do that to me? Wow. Now, if they're a Christian, hopefully they'll forgive you completely. But a reputation that has taken 30 years to build can be lost in 30 seconds. Wow. The trust that has taken 30 years to build can be lost in 30 seconds. Whoa. Booker T. Washington, um, an educator in the U.S., he once said, I will not let any man reduce my soul to a level of hatred. Wow. I will not let any man reduce my soul to a level of hatred. Here in South Africa, we see hatred. Yeah. We know hatred. And even now, after all the drama is over, it may not be that high gas stove. It may be low-grade anger, low-grade fear. Are you with me right there? We've got to show the love to this dark world. We've got to show them, not the way of Cain, but the way of Jesus. We've got to show them what real love looks like even when you're being hurt. Because when Cain killed his brother, he also killed himself spiritually. And we got to have a deep conviction. Where are you this morning? You may get more personal satisfaction from your anger, but in the end, you lose a lot more in the long run. What road are you traveling down this morning? I pray it's not the road of rebellion, resentment, or rejecting responsibility. Let's heed our brother Jude's admonition. Do not walk the way of Cain. Thank you and God bless you.